Howdy and welcome to the 10-Week Bible Study. This is week 7, day 1 of our study of the book of Exodus. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and today we're talking about Exodus chapter 25. Well, welcome back to the 10-Week Bible Study. I am your host, Darren Hibbs, and today we're looking at Exodus 25, where we're going to jump into the Lord's regulations for the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant and all of these things that are going to be the center of Jewish or Israeli, or the Israelite worship, I should say, Hebrew worship for the next couple of millennia. Before we do that, let's pray before we start. Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears to hear what your word has to say to us today, God. Speak to us. We want to hear from you. We want to know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, with that, let's go ahead and jump into God's word. We'll be reading today from the NIV. This is Exodus 25, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skins dyed red, and another type of durable leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and the breastplate. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I show you. So the Lord is actually going to show Moses what this is supposed to look like. Now remember, he's having this really otherworldly, heavenly encounter with God, and he's actually going to show him what this should look like. I don't think this is just plans, but maybe it's just plans. I think Moses is being invited in to see something in this eternal presence of God, that this tabernacle, all of these movable objects, the tent, and all of the things are going to have holes and poles to be able to be lifted up and moved and carried. But I think they're representing something permanent. Later, when the temple comes... It's going to look just like this, just with more permanence. But still, it's resembling something in this eternal place where God is. David, when he hands the plans to Solomon, as he's handing the kingdom over to Solomon, he tells him to build this. He said, build it like what I received from God. He tells him, here's the plans that I received directly from God. And so, you know, Moses and David are going to receive revelation about something before the throne of the Lord, about how this looks. We don't know exactly what it looks like, but we know that this is an earthly representation of what is around the Lord. When we read prophetic scriptures, end time scriptures, revelation, things like that, we see little hints of all of these things that are actually surrounding God. So there's something mystical and something important in all of these things. And, you know, there's so many things that you can glean off the internet, both good and crazy. I mean, the whole spectrum of things, but of these things, the symbols and all of these things that are here, there is so much to be understood. We're not going to have time to go into really any of that in the course of this study. If you're fascinated by those things, I encourage you to, to dive deeper. But don't do that at the expense of actually reading the book of Exodus and getting it in you by reading it over and over again. I would encourage everyone, don't ever sacrifice reading for the sake of studying. Studying is... Secondary, really, it's 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 on down the list of the things that are important that we do with God's word, reading it and filling our minds with it by just, you know, doing it on our, uh, on repeat. That's the most important thing that we can do. But if you've continued to read Exodus and you're fascinated by those things, I encourage you to find some books, go after these things and and just know that there's no right answers as far as you know, what these things mean, there's lots of wrong answers, lots of crazy answers. So you do have to be careful when you're searching those things out on the internet. But if there is a fascination in your heart, there are tons of good resources. Again, the way that you can spot a good resource from a bad resource is if you filled your mind with God's word. 
If you fill your mind with his word, you will be able to spot nine times out of 10, a really bad resource really quick. All right, moving on. Verse 10. Have them make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. Cast four rings for it and fasten them to its four feet with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry it. The poles are to remain in the rings of the ark. They're not to be removed. Then put the ark, then put in the ark the tablets of the covenant law, which I will give you. So Moses hasn't gotten the the tablets, you know, what we commonly, you know, we think of Moses coming down Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments on these tablets. It actually never tells us that here, at least that it's the Ten Commandments. It's the covenant law. We just always kind of assume that it's the Ten Commandments. It's very likely that's all that was on it, but there might have been more as well. We, We don't know. And in fact, the tablets that the Lord is going to write on and give to Moses We don't know what was on them because Moses is going to be so angry when he comes down the mountain, he's going to smash them. And then he's going to have to go back up and, you know, chisel out some more. And he's going to have to actually write in them. All right. Continuing on, make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. Verse 18, and make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one cherub on one end and on the second cherub on the other. Make the cherubim of one piece with the cover at the two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. Place the cover on top of the ark and put it, uh, put in it the ark, uh, the tablets of the covenant law that I will give you. There, above the covenant, b- b- above the cover, between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the covenant law, I will meet with you and will give you my commands for the Israelites. So, you know, commonly what this is looks like is people think that the you know the cherubim have got their wings kind of covering like this and and touching uh, one another in the center of the ark. Um, there, there's lots of artist renditions out there. If you Google them, you'll see all sorts of different representations in the end. We don't know exactly what this would have looked like, but we can, we can guess pretty close and and come up with it. And we know that it, it was sturdy. It's made of uh, a, a good hardwood and, and it's overlaid inside and out with gold. And so this thing is something to behold. It's not huge. But the gold covering this, I mean, the, the amount of gold they're going to take up in an offering for this is, is going to be amazing. And when you think about the value of the gold at this time in history, it's going to far surpass what we would think of the value of gold today. Because at this point in history, you know, they're still mining this stuff out of the ground wherever they can find it. And it's really hard to find good sources of gold. And so gold is is very rare at this point in history and very valuable. It would be way more valuable than what we would have considered in any time in the last probably two millennia. It's going to be so much more valuable. And so this little box in all of these things that we're going to talk about, they're going to be of such great value and such great beauty that it's going to be something to behold to see this group of people carrying around this gold plated box with these cherubim or angels or whatever you want to think of them on top. It's really, I'm I'm sure it was something to behold. Verse 23, make a table of acacia wood, two cubits long, a cubit wide and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. Also make it around it a rim, a hand breadth wide and put a gold molding on the rim. Make four gold rings for the table and fasten them to the four corners where the four legs are. The rings are to be close to the rim to hold the poles used in carrying the table. Make the poles of acacia wood, overlay them with gold and carry the table with them. And make its plates and dishes of pure gold as well as its pitchers and bowls for the pouring out of offerings. Put the bread of the presence on this table to be before me at all times times. Again, another sturdy table 
wrapped in gold all the way around. And again, if you can picture this, it's got four rings on, on the sides so that these poles can be slid through it so that the people can pick it up and hoist it and carry it. They're going to walk with it over their shoulders, you know, like this. Um, so there's going to be two rings on one side, two on the other. It's the same as the Ark. Most of the furnishings of the temple are going to be like this. The Lord did not want them to put anything on a cart. I mean, when we, f- we find out in 1 Samuel what happens when the people try and put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart, it's not supposed to happen. He wanted them to carry it. Now, he didn't tell them, never take the poles out of the table. You can move the poles in and out of the table, and that's fine, you know, because the table's something that needs to be accessed to put the bread on it, and so the poles would get in the way. But for the Ark, they slide the poles in, and they leave them there forever. And so it's interesting, you know, when you see uh, pictures and renditions of the temple, Solomon's temple, often you'll see, you know, people depict the Ark of the Covenant has still got the poles inside it, even in the temple, even though it never moves again, because the Lord said, don't move them, don't take them out. All right, verse 31, make a lampstand of pure gold, hammer out its base and shaft and make it uh, its flower like cups, buds and blossoms of one piece with them. Six branches are to extend from the sides of the lampstand, three on one side and three on the other. Three cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms are to be on one branch, three on the next branch, and the same for all six branches extending from the lampstand. And on the lampstand, there are to be four cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms. One bud shall be under the first pair of branches extending from the lampstand, a second bud under the second pair, and a third bud under the third pair, six branches in all. The buds and branches shall all be one piece with the lampstand hammered out of pure gold. Then make it seven lamps and set them up on them so that they light the space in front of it. Its wick trimmers and trays are to be of pure gold. A talent of pure gold is to be used for the lampstand and all these accessories. See that you make them according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. And so what we have is, you know, picture this, this tall lampstand with these six, uh, you know, arms coming out. They're supposed to look like almond branches and then one in the center. And it says, have it light the space in front of it. So more than likely where the actual lamp uh, portions are, there's going to be like a little gold reflector lens right there to cast the light in one direction. <clears throat> I imagine that when you walked into, you know, the tabernacle and then later the temple, you know, I imagine your eyes probably had to adjust when you walk out because of all the the shiny gold that's going to be going on in there. You know, one of the interesting things about gold is it does not oxidize, meaning it doesn't rust or like get a film on it very easily. You know, if you look at gold jewelry, you can commonly see that it gets dirty, but most of that's from just wear, getting it on your hands. Gold doesn't actually oxidize very well. And so it takes a very, very long time. And so if if you leave this alone or if you continue to polish it, you know, even mildly something like these things, uh, they're going to be very, very shiny, very reflective. I mean, very brilliant. And we're talking about a tremendous amount of gold here. And imagine walking into these small spaces that are lit up by these candles with all this gold. It's just going to be this, this golden haze that you're looking into. You're going to come out and you're just walk out of the the tent and you're going to have to, you know, get your eyes readjusted for a while. It must have been a sight to behold, to be one of these priests who get to go in on on, inside the ark on a regular, not the ark, but the tabernacle on a regular basis. Um, I mean, just thinking about the fact that you would have to adjust your eyes and then readjust them after coming out of going into and coming out of the presence of of the Lord. I think that's, there's, there's something amazing just in that right there. And all of these things, you know, this is an an incredibly opulent. Let's just say that this is incredibly opulent for us, but not for the God who said in the eternal city, Jerusalem, the streets, the pavement that I use, that's gold. Gold is what I use for the pavements in the eternal city. That's what the Lord tells us in revelation. And so This is definitely intended to be striking. All of this gold, all of these precious materials, gemstones, you know, all of these things, it is intended to be striking. The Lord wants us to know that that 
you know, his presence there, there's beauty and there's extravagance in his presence. Now that's not making a case for or against any kind of prosperity gospel or anything like that. The Lord, I mean, the Lord, the one that owns a cattle on a thousand hills, the money is nothing to him. It's absolutely nothing. He wants it to be something that's striking and bold to the people who see it. That's the point. That's part of the point here. Again, there's there's so much depth to the symbolism and, and things that are going on here. But th- I think the beauty and, and the color and just the, the overwhelming nature of what God is instructing them to build because it's something that Moses saw in these heavenly places. I think that's amazing. I hope you're fascinated by that. I want to be fascinated even more by these things. And I hope as we continue going through this, you continue reading this book 10 times in 10 weeks so your fascination grows. But that's it for today. For the 10-week Bible study, I'm your host, Darren Hibbs. I can't wait to see you next time.